So good evening. I would like to welcome everyone to Need a Know How on Marla Motet. She is uh, joining us as a equine nutritionist for Hygrate and the uh, owner of Legacy Equine Nutrition. So she has some amazing information to share with us and uh, she will be taking questions at the end. So if anyone has uh, any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. I will keep a running list and we will address those at the end. So without further ado, Dr. Motet, take it away. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm hoping you can hear me okay and you can all see my screen. But I am going to talk to you tonight about fueling the dressage horse. And talking about the performance athlete in general is a very near and dear topic to me. I myself am a rider. I do um, some three-day eventing, so not real dressage, but I do have a good concept of the kind of the kind of maneuvers that you all do. And I currently have a few horses that I'm dabbling in hunters with. So I'm also a horse person and I'm happy to be here tonight. So thank you for having me. Again, just very briefly, my name is Dr. Rachel Mote. My last name is really difficult, so Rachel Motet is okay too. But uh, I have a few degrees in the area of animal science and nutrition and very, very passionate about this topic. We could spend a whole... 16 weeks talking about fueling the dressage horse. However, we've got about 45 minutes tonight. So my goal is going to be to give you some key takeaways that you can start implementing as soon as this week with your own horse. But to give you a little bit of an idea of my professional background, I am mostly independent, but I do a bit of consulting for high gain. And the reason I do that is because, um, and you can see in my background, I have worked for Purina in the past. I've consulted for a few other feed companies. I do really like what High Gain's doing in the marketplace, and we're really going to focus on the needs of your horse tonight. But um, if you have questions about these products, you can certainly reach out to me. And then there's a local rep up your way, Whitney, who's listening in. And there's a lot of great resources for you through High Gain. So keep that in mind if you have questions about the products. I also run my own business as an independent equine nutritionist. I teach online courses. I run a Facebook group, which I'll show you in just a moment. And I've done some teaching in this subject at the collegiate level. So again, a lot of interest in talking about equine nutrition. So if that's something you like too, I would be happy to chat with you more in depth on some of these topics. A place that you can find me, I have a Facebook group called Equine Nutrition Education. I like to play games in that group. I really don't talk much about brands at all. For instance, I put up a post I recently did and I asked members of the group to identify the five varieties of hay that you can see in that picture. So it's just kind of a fun group that you can get unbiased factual information from PhDs and DVMs. So if you like nutrition, I encourage you to check it out. It's a free group and a really great bunch of people. Other places you can find me it would be LegacyEquineNutrition.com. I do a lot of educational seminars. I have a vault of those there. Like I mentioned, I teach courses and you know I do offer one-on-one -on -one consults. If you want to talk to me about high gain products, that's something I do on behalf of high gain free of charge. There of course is a charge if you want to talk to me about other nutrition questions or products. So you can find me after this at my website or on my Facebook group, LegacyEquineNutrition.com. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into the content tonight. And uh, my mission is to help you draw some pictures in your mind. And my first question to help you do that would be, as we think about fuel, if we were to fuel horses the same way either our parents or our grandparents did, what would this diet look like? Now, I'm guessing some of you in your head have a few thoughts that come to mind, but um, if you had a vision of oats come up, that would be correct. If you had a vision of some corn, maybe cracked corn, that would be correct. And who can forget the good old Folgers coffee can? When I was a kid, every horse in the barn got 
some level of corn and oat mix in the Folgers coffee can. And then of course, hay. The question becomes, can we still feed and fuel horses this way? I will tell you there are still people who do this. However, nutrition has changed and you've noticed horse health, horse longevity has changed too as a result. We now use better ingredients, feed technology, production processes, something very unique to high gain that we do is called micronization, where we actually break up large starch molecules so that they won't spill over into the hindgut. Our understanding has also improved as a scientific community on GI physiology, so gastrointestinal physiology, nutrient requirements of the horse. A huge area of interest would be microbiome species identification. We're trying to identify the millions of bacteria that reside in the gut of our horse and identify what's healthy and what's not healthy. Huge area of research, not only in horses, but other species, also in humans. We've also been able to optimize nutrition for better health. So can we do that traditional corn oats diet? You can. However, what I'm going to talk about, about tonight is how to optimize and how to do a bit better so we can give our horse every chance through nutrition to feel, look, and perform their best. So what do you need to know? Well, the thing that you need to know is how to take a good forage and a good feed or concentrate and turn it into a good performing horse. So the four critical takeaways that I want you to be thinking about after today and that I want you to implement in your own program or apply to your own horse, number one, we're going to talk about body condition scoring. When you see that acronym BCS, that's what it stands for. I want you to know it, practice it, and maintain it in your horse. I'm going to talk about that one in just a moment. The second critical takeaway is going to be forage first and what that means. A forage first diet will set the stage for health, vitality, and any good equine nutrition program. Now, any nutritionist and feed company, if they tell you otherwise, don't walk, run, because every good for or every good equine nutrition program starts with good quality hay or pasture. The third thing we're going to talk about is fuel. And there are different types of fuel. There's fat, there's carbs, protein even gets in there. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to utilize those for your horse and when your horse needs each of them. And lastly, I'm going to ask some more thought-provoking questions about once you have these pieces in place, how does that horse look, feel, and perform? How do you know if you've got these pieces optimized? So that is what is to come in this presentation tonight. The first thing, body condition scoring. Now I know that this group has a wide variety of background in horses and nutrition and doing things like body condition scoring. If this is something you've never heard of, I highly encourage you to familiarize yourself with it. Body condition scoring is a subjective assessment of adipose tissue accumulation, adipose meaning fat tissue accumulation, in several different areas on the horse. Now, why this is important to you, number one, there's going to be an ideal standard for the show ring. A horse that's competing in dressage, most of them that I work with are going to score somewhere between a six and seven. A six to seven is a horse that's a bit fleshy. I realize these pictures are cartoons, so it may be a little bit difficult to infer exactly how this horse would look, but there is an expectation when you're competing in dressage that your horse is going to look nice and full. Now, we don't want that horse to be obese, but they should look appropriate for the discipline. It's no different for my hunters that I'm currently riding. They need to look full, healthy, a lot of bloom, a lot of shine, and that's in contrast to when I ride eventers. So this scale, as you can see, goes from one to nine and five is that just right. When you have a horse that's a five, you don't see ribs, you don't have that extra squish, but they are just right. 
So when I'm riding my adventures, I want them to be a five. When I'm working with racehorses, I want them to be pretty darn close to a five. Some racehorse trainers might want that horse more like a four and a half, but I like those ones that need to be long and lean to be a five. And this body condition scoring system, it's been around for a while. If you're unfamiliar with how to utilize this, this scale and how to perform on um, looking at these different areas, I've got this picture of a horse on here. This is a client that I've worked with before. His name is Jersey. And you can see those five stars on him. So when you body condition score your horse, what I want you to do is to palpate, meaning feel with your hand and look for fat in those areas. That yellow star, star around the neck, when you have a horse that's getting to the upper end and unhealthy end of that body condition scoring system, you're going to start seeing and feeling crestiness and fat deposition on the neck. Dressage horses in particular, because a lot of dressage riders work with warm bloods, Spanish type horses, they are often um, genetically predisposed to being easy keepers. So this is an area that we really have to look out for. The orange uh, star, which I realize may be a little bit tricky to see, this is behind the shoulder. Now, this is another spot that fat will accumulate and kind of pool if our horse is getting fleshy. And fleshy is a nice word for fat. If you can see like a little bowl of fat without even going up to your horse, which many people with warm bloods can, I've owned warm bloods most of my life. Some of them, you feel like they're born with that little pool of fat behind the shoulder. That's an area you're going to palpate. Over the rib cage, this area is going to be really important. And the score itself, you're taking a cumulative score or a cumulative assessment from all the areas I'm talking about. However, the ribs are going to play a big role in the ultimate final score. So for instance, if this horse, if we could see his ribs before palpating him, automatically, he would have to be less than a five. Okay, the reason or the fact that we can't see his ribs by looking at this slide tells us that he's at least a five or better. So then we have to get good at feeling these areas and saying, all right, am I having to hunt for my horse's ribs or are they right under the skin? When I place my hand along the back where that pink star is, does my hand tent, meaning my horse is too thin, or does my hand become inverted where I could pour a glass of water down my horse's back and it would pool. The other spot we're gonna look is around the tail head. So what you would do if you're palpating this area is you would look, so towards the top of the tail on either side, and a lot of our horses that are a bit on the fleshy side, it's going to feel kind of like a jet puffed marshmallow around the tail head. And these are the five main areas that are gonna help us identify if our horse is too thin, too fleshy, or just right. Again, this is subjective, so it doesn't really tell us the full story with what's going on around the organs, what's going on in the body, but it does give us clues in how to assess, hey, is my horse getting not enough calories per day? Is my horse getting way too much? And I highly encourage all of you to start when you go home Take a profiled picture just like this of your horse and do that every month because we can body condition score them and we can use weight tapes, but pictures are often going to tell a much better story. And the best way you can do that is to have the horse perpendicular to you, just like this picture I have. You're going to stand about 10 feet back from just behind the shoulder and get a shot of that horse pretty straight on. When you get too far in front of your horse, it's going to hollow out that horse a bit. And if you get too far behind that horse, it's going to make your horse look larger than he is oftentimes. Now, I used to be a feed rep, and that was a little trick I learned early on. And I was very honest about taking pictures. But I see sometimes feed and supplement companies do this where they'll take a picture of a horse from in front of the shoulder with its head elevated and then the after picture will be from behind the rump with its head nice and relaxed, which will elongate the top line, make that horse look like it's got a nice 
filled in round top line. So there are ways to deceive ourselves if we don't take this picture quite right. But I recommend that you take one of these at least once a month to track how your horse looks, body condition score, and make sure that you are in a safe space for BCS with your horse. So that range is about a 4.5 to 6 would be ideal. And we need to think if we get beyond that six, so if we enter seven, eight, nine territory, and on the flip side, if we enter three, two, one territory, this is going to directly and negatively impact performance of our horse. So when we think about bringing our horse out, trying to get our horse to perform the maneuvers, climb the levels, or just have a good time, feel good, recover, we really ought to keep them in this healthy zone. The horse carrying way too much weight is going to have problems performing at the same level as one with the same fitness but has healthy body condition. A horse that's in negative energy balance or thin is also likewise going to have difficulty performing to their potential because their energy is going to be conserved to maintaining basal bodily function. So body condition scoring is incredibly important and Hopefully, some of you listening in are already doing this. If you're not, you can even Google or YouTube. There are a lot of resources out there on this. So I had to make sure that I chatted a bit about this before we talk about different types of fuel. And again, body condition scoring in your horse, ideal for your horse's health, longevity, and optimal performance. And I look at this rider's horse on the right. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I want to go to the show with my horse turned out like that. That horse looks stunning. And dependent, I'm assuming almost everyone listening in is a dressage rider, but that really would be the pinnacle of what I'm trying to achieve with riders. This horse isn't obese, but it is nice and full as a dressage horse should look. And this horse looks beautifully turned out to go to a show. So when talking about body condition scoring, I always feel like it's interesting to talk about what it takes to get there, what it takes to manipulate body condition score and thinking about this in a slightly different way. So it's kind of fun to think about how many calories, which we refer to in the horse diet as kcals or mcals, kcal is a kilocalorie or mcals is a megacalorie. So thinking about how many kcals the horse needs to do his job properly. And what you can see if you're looking at this table is as the energy load or as the workload increases, of course, the KCAL requirement goes up. So a horse at maintenance, if you're looking to the far left of this graph, that means a horse that's not in work. That horse might be a pasture pet for the time being, but a horse at maintenance needs about 16 to 17 mcals per day. So that's 16 to 18,000 kcals. And the kcal is equivalent to a human calorie. So imagine that most humans need about 2000 calories per day. Your horse that's not doing much of any exercise and is otherwise healthy, not a hard keeper, most will need about 16 to 18,000 calories, kcals per day. And as we start to increase, we go into work, that requirement goes up all the way. A number of you are going to have horses in light and moderate work. Those would be the more common categories of exercise where we've got a horse working with somewhere around two to four days per week. Um, heavy work is going to be more like four to five days where that horse is doing a combination of some anaerobic, aerobic work, um, some intense type of work. Intense is a category that most of our horses won't get to. This is the horse working for at least an hour, if not more, hard work six days a week. Whoops. Sorry about that. So this gives us a little bit of an idea of how many calories our horse needs and how that relates, you know, to, to put these together. When we think about body condition score, you know, we're thinking, okay, if my horse is underweight, he's getting not enough calories. If my horse is overweight, he's getting a calorie surplus. He's in a positive energy balance. So we need to think about as we dive into the nutrition conversation, 
the best way to maintain my horse's needs for calories, for energy, for nutrients with while keeping him in that ideal zone. And this gets kind of tricky because the thing that this chart doesn't tell you or doesn't consider is your horse's natural metabolic predisposition. I don't know about you guys, but there are people in my family who eat everything they want, my mom included, and stay a size two their entire life. Then there are other people like me who might have a summer where I eat a little more than normal and I go from a size six to a size 10. So this doesn't take into account our horse's unique metabolism. However, it does give us some interesting guidelines. And also just for an interesting fun fact, if you're wondering, I mean, it's interesting to look at this, but you might be thinking, well, how many calories are in a pound of hay and in a pound of feed? Most hay is going to be around 900-ish kcals per pound. And most feed, really, it's going to vary pretty widely, but usually somewhere around 1,200 to about 16 or 1,700 kcals per pound. So something to just think about. And some horses, like I just mentioned, need more. Some are those easy keepers who need a little less, but uh, just some food for thought. So how do we make sure that we're fulfilling our horse's nutritional and energy requirements to keep them in that healthy body condition? I mentioned this before, but no matter what program you adopt, forage first should be your approach. The reason being is horses who have been evolving for millions of years has, have evolved as animals that will spend around 14 to 16 hours of the day eating grass, foraging. Because of that, their digestive anatomy is highly sophisticated in the large intestine. So in the hindgut where fiber is fermented. So remembering grass is predominantly fiber, so horses are really, really good at fermenting fiber. And because they'd spend most of the day grazing naturally, the stomach is quite small. It continuously secretes acid and it empties pretty quickly. So not much of what we do with the domesticated horse is entirely natural, or I mean, we get as close as we can, but this is something that we need to think about when we're feeding horses, that their body is truly designed to be consuming fiber on a pretty regular basis. Now, where this becomes kind of a challenge in the wild, there's going to be periods where good quality forage is not available. You're going to have horses, they might need to eat tree bark. They might get a little skinny in the winter during a period of dormancy for the grass. However, in a domesticated situation, Every day I go out to my pasture and I hand my horse what looks like a salad of orchard alfalfa, right? He doesn't need to do any work. He just needs to exist and come to the fence and eat it. So there are some ways that we try and work to create a program that really lends itself to the digestive anatomy of the horse, but also keeps them from becoming obese. Let's talk a little more about that. When we think about the feeding rates, of how much hay the horse should be getting, most horses are gonna consume somewhere around 1.5 to 2, 2.5% of their body weight in forage per day. Now, this is going to vary wildly based on your horse's health status, their metabolic predisposition, on what kind of forage you have available. It might be a drought year and the only forage you can get is stemmy and it's not that good, and when your horses eat it, it doesn't give them that nice shine that a more optimal, good, strong grass would. So we have to think about this as something that's evolving. And most horses, you know, that I'm going to work with, like I said, we aim for about 1.5 to 2% of their body weight in forage per day. And if horses can maintain good ideal body condition on free choice hay, by all means, put them on free choice hay. The more chewing and salivating they can do, the more forage that goes through the stomach and the hindgut, the better for the horse. However, the time where this more natural approach 
becomes problematic is when we have horses who are obese or overweight. And this becomes a bit of a conundrum because naturally, and I see this argument on social media a lot, people want to say, well, horses should be eating hay all the time. Well, in theory, they should be spending a good portion of their day eating hay. However, if they are obese, we do need to think about limiting their hay because the consequences of obesity are far worse, in my opinion, than a stomach that might be a little empty for a few hours of time. You know, I want a horse to have access to forage all the time. However, I don't want a horse to founder. And if any of you listening have seen an obese or a pony um, founder, it's pretty traumatic for the horse and for the owner. So when I'm thinking about horses that need reduced forage intake, something that I love to do is incorporate slow feeder hay nuts slow down the time it takes that horse to eat that hay. A brand that I really love is called Hay Chicks. They make probably the most durable hay net on the market, and they make them very small whole. You can get a one-inch micro mini if you need to. And the longer it takes for that horse to eat that forage, the more we're going to have something in the stomach, which again, continuously secretes acid, and the more we're going to have the hindgut working. So this would be ideal. And this, you know, this is under the assumption that everyone listening in is in the U.S. and you're feeding dry forage because these percents would look quite a bit different. And I work with a lot of international clients. If you're feeding haylage, that's more like 50, 55 percent moisture. But for your dry cut forage, these intake percents are going to be pretty common. Now, the textbook would tell us that if we have an extremely obese horse, the minimum amount of hay that we could feed them per day and still keep the gut functioning would be 1% of their body weight. I never have and never will recommend a horse goes on 1% of their body weight in forage, because if you think of your 1,000 pound horse, that would be 10 pounds of forage per day. That just quite simply is not enough. Maybe 1.2% body weight would be the lowest I would go, and that would really only be in cases of active founder or laminitis where the horse is on stall rest, obese, and recovering, and it can't exercise. So keep these percents in mind as you think about how much your horse should be getting if you're the one that makes the feeding decision for your horse or gives them feed every day. If you're thinking to yourself, I have no idea how much my flake of hay weighs, which even if you think you do, I promise 99% of you don't know how much your flake of hay weighs. Get a little fish scale, get a luggage scale, throw some twine around a flake, and you have to do this with each bale unless they've all been cut you know, and came from the same place. I live in Florida where my supply changes every three weeks, so I wait, make a habit of weighing my hay each time I get a new batch. So get a little fish scale or a luggage scale, see how much you're actually feeding. Because one way we end up with equine obesity, especially in these horses that are predisposed to obesity, is by giving too much of a good thing. And I know putting horses on diets is not fun, but if you have a horse that is above that six, six and a half body condition score and going into that obesity zone, I highly encourage you to think about making some modifications in the forage intake. And again, uh, just to reiterate, the quality of hay is going to impact the feeding rate. So a legume like alfalfa, or down here in the south, we've got perennial peanut hay. When I lived in Minnesota, we had a lot of clover. Those are going to be our legumes, just a few examples. Those are generally higher in protein. And those are also, many of them, lower in non-structural carbohydrates. There's a big misconception and I think it's kind of fading out that alfalfa, because it's richer, it's higher in kcals per pound, that it's also, you know, higher in protein, more nutrient dense, that it's also higher in non-structural carbohydrates. Truth be told, it's actually lower than most grasses. So keep that in mind. Horses, you know, if you're feeding alfalfa, a lot of times they're going to need a bit less than if you're feeding a grass or, you know, it's not a one-to-one -one type of step usually when you go from a grass to alfalfa or vice versa. 
But step number one, make sure when you go home, your horse has a good forage uh, program in place. You can incorporate, you know, cubes and pellets are something that have become more and more popular. The only downside, and I like, personally, I like using some alfalfa pellets in, I have a two-year-old horse. I use those in his diet. I really like them. There's a purpose for them, but something to think about is if you're replacing long stem forage with an alfalfa cube or pellet, while that is something that can be done, it takes them so much less time and so many less chews. So chewing stimulates salivation. So we do need to think about keeping something, some kind of long stem forage in front of our horse as much as possible. And while you can replace some with that, um, you want to find a good balance for all the reasons just stated. And again, also keeping something in the stomach. I recommend to most of my performance riders, and here's a little tip that you can take with you as well. Before you ride and when you're grooming and getting your horse ready, if you just got to the barn, you're not sure if they've been eating, give them a pound or two of hay or even pellet, something to get in the stomach. And what that forms is called a fiber mat. And that fiber mat is going to help serve as essentially a barrier. It's going to help protect the upper portion of the stomach, which is highly susceptible to squamous um, ulcers. It's also going to help soak up some of those gastric acid juices and neutralize the pH of the stomach. So forming that fiber mat before you're working at gates where that acid that's formed in the stomach continuously can splash upward and cause irritation. So something I would recommend, just a little tip for anyone, make sure your horse has some forage in their stomach before you go to ride them. So once you've got the forage piece dialed in and in place, is forage all they need? I want you to think about that for a second. Is forage all they need? A lot of people would tell me, they'd say, Rachel, I've had horses for 50 years and they've been out on pasture and they've done amazingly. That's fantastic. That is fantastic. However, what I will say is even the best quality grass even the best quality hay is going to have some holes when it comes to trace minerals in particular. If you're feeding chopped or cut hay that's been dried, you're going to have some big holes in vitamins, beta carotene, vitamin E. Those are going to diminish pretty rapidly after a forage is cut. You're going to find an abundant source of vitamin K in pasture. You will not find that in chopped forage. So is forage all they need? The forage is going to be a huge element of the diet. But when we think about optimizing, which me as a nutritionist, that's what I'm trying to do. We want to think about filling in any of those nutritional gaps. So it's kind of, you know, that person getting back to the example I just gave, you know, my horses have been living for 50 years or I've had them and they've never needed anything except salt and pasture. Well, you know, we can live to be 80, 90, 100 without taking our daily vitamin. But what we're trying to do is give our horse every tool possible to be the best athlete they can, to feel the best they can, look the best they can, stay healthy and live longer. So genetically, some animals, even though we do everything wrong, can live a long, healthy life. But why would we not try to make sure that we're promoting really good health and longevity in our horse through nutrition? So when the question becomes, is forage all they need? I would say no. So as we continue that conversation, if forage isn't all they need, what other things can we think about? Well, the things that we need to think about, even before we go into the equation of what type of feed, we need to think about what type of fuel sources are available. So I'll talk a little bit about those now. So our main types of fuel that we can provide for the horse in different forms, carbohydrates. So carbohydrates in the form of non-structural carbohydrates and fiber, fat, and then protein, which there are some little parentheses around, which I'll explain in a moment. The main fuel for our horse, particularly those 
at maintenance is going to be fiber. Now, people don't always think of fiber as being part of the carbohydrate family, but it is. It has bonds between or between glucose molecules that cannot be broken down enzymatically. And so this is reliant upon the microbes in the gut of the horse, particularly the hindgut, to break that down or ferment it and turn those into what are called volatile fatty acids. So I have this little picture to the right. If you're someone who likes biochemistry, I love biochemistry. But what happens is you end up with volatile fatty acids that can be used for energy. So a horse in the wild that's only foraging, this is going to fuel their maintenance energy needs, these volatile fatty acids. And it can, and of course this does in the horse as well. Um, there is more than just fiber in forage. There's going to be some starch, there's protein, very little fat, but there's vitamins, minerals. However, predominantly it's going to be fiber. The thing to know about it is fiber is a good energy source. However, the energy conversion is slower when we think of glycogen repletion than starch and sugar. So if you're unfamiliar with glycogen and glycogen repletion, glycogen is what gets stored in the liver and the muscle after the body breaks down and absorbs simple sugars from starch or just simple sugars on their own. So glycogen is going to be the fuel that's stored up in the tank when the body needs to exercise, okay? So fiber is going to be a good source of energy, but there are some other sources of energy that the body can utilize very efficiently, particularly for equine athletes. Before I go on to um, some of the other ones, something to think about, you know, fiber is not all created equal. And fiber actually was the, the focus of my PhD, looking at prebiotic fibers. And fibers, there are some that can be rapidly fermented and are highly available to the microbiota in the hindgut. So beet pulp is a really good super fiber source. So these are going to feed the good bacteria in the gut and help them proliferate. Soy hulls, another super fiber. Lupin hulls. Lupin is not an ingredient that you're going to see in U.S. products. It is an ingredient that you're going to see in the high gain feeds because Australian lupins are going to be abundant in Australia, not here, of course. And this serves as a super fiber, the hull of an Australian lupin. So these are things that you'd find in a number of feeds, some of them, but particularly in some of the high gain lineup, which makes them good for supporting digestive health. Another fuel source in that carbohydrate family, starch and sugar. And I know for a lot of us, this is kind of a, you know, NSC is kind of an ugly word, especially because our kind of an ugly acron acronym, it's several words. But for a lot of you listening, if you've got an easy keeper that's prone to obesity, we need to fuel them, but doing lower starch and sugar can be a viable option. Now, if you look at this slide, starch and sugar is the body's preferred and most efficient source of energy. However, we can find energy from other sources. And what happens is when your body ingests starch and sugar, it can be absorbed in the small intestine. And if it's not utilized for energy following ingestion, it'll be stored as glycogen in the muscle and liver, excess uh, glucose beyond that is converted to fat and stored. So when your horse is doing quite a bit of hard work, if your horse has a pretty intense job, if they're working at you know, higher levels where they're doing a mix of work that requires their heart rate to pass what's called the anaerobic threshold, that would be 150 beats per minute in the horse, that horse is really going to rely upon glycogen, they're going to re rely on stored fat, but they do need some starch and sugar in the diet. And working with a nutrition consultant can be really helpful in identifying how much. It's difficult for me to put a blanket statement and say, well, based on this level, you need this amount because it would take knowing more about your horse, their health, their genetic predisposition, all those kinds of things, their breed, but a little element of starch and sugar in the diet 
isn't the worst thing ever. Now, if your horse on the flip side has starch and sugar sensitivities, the high gain lineup has a number of products that fit that need that are the lowest NSC products on the market that can be considered. You are still going to get energy from those products through super fibers, but you're going to get a very low glycemic index and very low sugar starch concentration. Another source of fat or another source of fuel rather is fat. Now it used to be thought that horses could not digest and absorb fat. And the reason being, here's a little fun fact for you. Horses do not have a gallbladder. And if you know much about anatomy and physiology, you might know that the function of the gallbladder is to produce and secrete bile, which will emulsify fat. And by emulsifying it, essentially that means it puts it into a form in very simple terms where it can be absorbed in the body. A colleague of mine, she was one of the first at Texas A&M to try feeding higher fat levels or fat supplements to horses. And people used to say, no, you can't do that. Horses don't have a gallbladder and they can't digest it. Well, truth be told, what we know now, horses can very efficiently digest and absorb fat from the diet and they do secrete bile continuously and it's produced by the liver. Fat can be a really nice option if you have a horse, so as a fuel source, it has more calories per gram than any other fuel source. So for instance, one gram of protein or carbohydrate is going to have four calories in that gram. And one gram of fat is going to have nine calories in that gram. So when we see some of these really high fat products in the marketplace, we end up seeing products that are very high in kcals per pound typically. So the cool thing about fat and the, the place that I often use fat, well, there's two main places, but it's a slow burning fuel source. And slow burning mean a very non meaning something very non-technical, but it's not metabolized the same as starch and sugar. So you think of, you know, eating a candy bar, so something loaded with starch and sugar versus eating a high fat meal. I'm trying to think of something, not much is coming to mind, even though I eat a lot of high fat foods, but the way that fat is metabolized, it doesn't enter the bloodstream as sugar. It doesn't elicit that insulin response like sugar and starch do. So it is more slowly converted into utilizable energy, but it is a very efficient, cool burning fuel source. And it's interesting, a lot of the preliminary work with fat would indicate that even two to three ounces supplemented per day can result in a shinier hair coat, better quality skin. So I give my horse, it's called RBO, um, it's rice bran oil. Oops, they get that each day. I put a big glug on their feed. Um, also the true gain would be the high gain fat supplement. My two-year-old who's a bit harder keeper, he gets that one as well. The nice thing, if you don't like oil or if you need quite a bit of a fat supplement, there are a lot of extruded products on the market. So most good fat supplements are going to be extruded. The extrusion is going to help um, keep rancidity at bay. So give those fat supplements a longer shelf life. And the horses where I like to use a fat supplement, for one, if I'm trying to be really strategic about getting more weight on a horse, Two, if I have a horse that's really hot, that, you know, we're trying to find something to, that, that metabolizes a bit slower, is metabolized a bit slower and cooler in the body and isn't causing that spike in blood glucose after consuming. Now, nutrition and behavior, not a perfect science. So just because you substitute starch and sugar with fat doesn't mean in every horse that they're going to have a calmer, quieter disposition. But I will tell you, it's worth a try. And a lot of horses respond really well to fat supplements instead of just more feed. So fat can be a very efficient source of fuel in addition to carbohydrates. The other fuel source being protein. 
And the reason I put quotations or sorry, parentheses around this is because protein is what we would refer to as very metabolically expensive. And what that means is it actually costs the body energy to convert protein into utilizable energy. And the body really won't do that unless it absolutely needs to. So protein, if you've ever had a biology or biochemistry course, you know that proteins and amino acids are involved in so many things in the body. So muscle development, they're part of antibodies, they're involved in hair and hoof quality, they are, um, there's different hormones that are protein hormones, uh, there's transport proteins in the blood. Proteins do everything in the body. So if your body is relying on protein as fuel, that means you are in a very serious negative energy balance or state that your body is pulling from anywhere it can because it doesn't have enough nourishment from carbohydrates, fat, and the diet as a whole or the other nutrients in the diet. So when we think about putting weight on a horse, you know, we're not always looking or grabbing the protein supplement, but when we're thinking about trying to optimize muscle mass, going for a good quality protein supplement is something that I'd highly encourage you to think about. Now, good quality feeds that are on the market are going to have high quality or good superior amino acid profiles that are going to support good muscle mass. However, kind of like your human athlete, if you're trying to give your body a little nudge towards genetic potential for its capability of muscling, it absolutely does not hurt to try an amino acid supplement. So can we push a horse past where genetically their body says their muscling is going to max out? No, but can we give them extra tools to get there? Like the guy at the gym that's taking his creatine every day or the protein shake. It's going to help not only muscles recover, but also promote muscle mass. So there's some really great amino acid supplements out there that can help do that. And I highly encourage if you've ever thought about doing a protein supplement, give it a good 60 days before you really make a decision as to whether or not it's, it's made a difference. And do that profiled picture that I talked about a bit before, where you take a picture on day zero, day 30, 60, 90, so you can track progress. It's kind of amazing what you see when you add a good high quality amino acid supplement onto your horse's already balanced ration in terms of what it can do for muscle integrity. So that's something to think about, but also knowing when we're trying to fuel the horse, we're not really looking at protein to do that. We're looking at some of those other things we talked about, but protein definitely has a place in the diet. So the thing to think about now is how do we put that all together? How do we take some of these pieces that I just mentioned, put it all together for our own horse. The first thing that I want you to do, I want you to make sure that you know how to body condition score your horse. I want you to know by the end of this week, that's my challenge for you, which there's not much left in the week, but by the end of this week, I want you to know if your horse is overweight, underweight, or just right. And if you can know that and be well versed in that, you will know more than many, many horse owners. And this is going to be helpful. If you have a horse that's obese, it's time to start thinking about some modifications in the diet so you don't end up with a horse with metabolic syndrome. So you don't end up with a horse that's foundering. If you have a horse that's under condition, time to think about increasing the kcals in the diet. In the horse, it takes about eight to 9,000 additional kcals over their current diet to result in one pound of weight gain. Now that's a little different than it is in humans, but that's the estimation. So when you think about, okay, my horse you know, needs to gain 50 pounds, I wanna make sure that over the course of the next 90 days, or maybe even 50 days, that they're getting on a daily basis, eight to 9,000 more kcals than was in their previous diet per day. If that doesn't make sense, you have resources, myself, high gain rep Whitney, who's listening in and we can help you. But I want you to be able to identify if your horse is overweight, underweight, or just right. 
and looks appropriate for your discipline. I also want you to take a look at your horse and say, you know, does he look good? Does he look filled out? Do his muscles look like, you know, they should? Do they look as good as they ever have? Now, if your horse hasn't been doing any exercise and the muscles don't look great, well, that might be assumed. However, if your horse is in an exercise program, they're working hard and they don't have good defined muscle tone, it may be time to think about an amino acid supplement. If your horse is underweight, it may be time to be thinking about a different feed or a fat supplement. The next thing I want you to think about with your horse, is their forage plan appropriate for them? Do they have as continuous access as possible to forage that is not promoting obesity or is not promoting under condition? The other thing to think about, is my horse getting the right kind of fuel? Now, how can you tell? What I want you to do is really tune in to your horse. Every ride, do you get 10 minutes in and you're like, oh my God, I don't have any horse. I got nothing. I've got no fuel. Or are you 10 minutes in and like, oh my God, I've got to gallop 20 more minutes just to get him to be rideable. And sometimes when it comes to this, we're fighting against nature. However, other times it comes down to they're either getting too much fuel or they're not getting the right kind. So tuning into your horse can be really helpful in understanding, okay, what does my horse actually need to feel his best and perform also so that I can ride him? For instance, I recently had to change fuel on my hunter, he's been on stall rest, unfortunately, for some time after tearing a ligament, put him back on a performance feed as he's now cantering under saddle again. He is so hot, he's going to hurt us all. So we had to move him from a performance feed to a ration balancer plus a fat supplement and beet pulp. So we changed the fuel and we have a different horse to work with. So sometimes it's as simple as that and you have resources. So these are some key and critical things. And just, you know, does my horse look, feel, perform his best? Is he healthy? Is this where he should be given how much he's working and exercising, how much we're doing together? Keeping in mind, every horse is going to have somewhat different confirmation and somewhat different genetic potential to look and feel optimally, but there are so many tools out there in veterinary medicine, and also in nutritional science that can help you get there. And because I do consult for high gain, and I tried to make this um, not a commercial because really this was more intended to educate you, but in a sea of feed and supplements, where to turn, you have resources. And I'm certain that the organizer of our event tonight will connect you with Whitney, or you can connect with high gain feeds, we have a website that's very easy to get in touch with us. If you need help figuring out what your horse should be getting, we can help you. So with that, I would be very happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you so much. That was a very informative presentation. We do have a few questions that have been posted in the chat. Uh, first, we had somebody that was interested about what feeds you would recommend for a horse with fecal water syndrome? Ooh, good question. So that, <laughs> that question requires a lot more information. So those listening, if you're not as familiar with fecal water, that is, it's not diarrhea, but it's water prior to or just after a horse defecates. So has manure, goes to the bathroom, right? And it's pretty unclear and a bit baffling what actually causes it. I have some suspicion about what causes it. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to do with the feed. So horses with fecal water syndrome, I've been able to clear this up in, I have a hundred percent success rate at clearing up fecal water, but typically I'm making an assumption that the reason this is occurring is because there is inflammation somewhere in the digestive tract and what we need to do or what we do to clear that up is give the horse a smaller particle size for some portion of the forage. So we may replace it with forage pellet, 
cube, beet pulp, and try and reduce the mechanical load and trauma in the hindgut and give any inflammation time to subside. Sometimes also incorporating a good pre and probiotic if there is some kind of uh, microbial dysbiosis going on can be helpful. But when it comes to what kind of feed would be best, what I will say, don't fall prey to the different supplement gimmicks. There are some that you can try. And if you have success, fantastic. But if you try something, you know, for a while um, in the Facebook group, it's like chia seeds or this MU biome product or this or that. Horses have very unique microflora. So meaning one horse in the barn looks different in terms of what microbes reside in their hindgut, even than the horse that lives next door, even if they're eating the same thing and doing the same thing. So what can be really tricky is you can go through a whole wealth of these different supplements and still not find the answer. But there is a protocol that I have that I use with horses like that. And it's not easy to, to state on the fly. But what I would say is incorporating a small particle fiber, forage fiber into the par or into the program, a lot of times makes a big difference. And in a number of horses I've worked with has cleared it up. If you want more info on that, you can certainly contact me after this conversation. Having more details about the history is important. Finding out if it's something that's seasonal. Does it happen every year at a certain time? Does it, you know, looking for a pattern of step one, step two is modifying the diet, but I'm definitely not on the bandwagon that there's a certain feed or supplement that will change it under the assumption that there isn't, you know, something in that feed that's irritating the intestinal tract. But there's, in my experience in working with that, I don't generally find that to be the case. I generally have to, you know, infer that there's some type of inflammation for whatever reason that culprit unknown never will be figured out, but uh, that's my approach that I take. Great question. So the flip side of that, and it sounds like you've covered it a little bit, is are there specific ingredients that you would suggest avoiding with a horse that's having that syndrome? You know, not necessarily. Um, ingredient sensitivities can happen in horses. However, they are pretty rare. Um, you know, there are some, there would be a fair amount of people that would report their horse having soy sensitivities. Now, the science wouldn't indicate that that's something that you have to be extremely concerned about or is that prevalent, but there are some feeds specifically in our lineup that are soy free. Um, but I would say sometimes it's trying a different product. There aren't any ingredients though that pop out and just tell me this is, you know, an aggravant or this is really inflammatory when most horses eat it or horses with these issues. It's very individual. Some of them it's different varieties of hay. Some of them, it's just the fact that there's too much dust in the hay. Um, yeah. So Sorry, I don't have something more concrete, but, uh, you know, trying, trying different products can be a good way to, to see if the feed is involved or might be involved. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we had somebody that had a question about, uh, when your horses are living outside, particularly during the colder months, is there a different percentage of, uh, feeds and components? you know, components of it based on the temperature differences? Yeah. So that's a great question. And it, it really depends on, it depends on what you're doing with your horse in the colder temperatures. So there is this thought that many people have that if it's cold outside and I'm cold, my horse needs a ton more forage. Well, if we get below that, um, you know, below that lower critical temperature, there's a thermal neutral zone that the horse doesn't need to expend energy to stay warm. And that'll differ in horses, but I want to say, generally speaking, under 40 degrees, I don't believe there's a perfect percent um, or off the top of my head, I can't recall what that would be. But usually the thought is we're going to add more forage because fiber fermentation does generate metabolic heat. What I would say though, um, so in general, when it's cold, 
when it's snowy, you know, if your horse isn't obese, add extra forage. If you have a horse that's overweight or obese, use that as an opportunity, knowing that they are going to require energy and burn energy to stay warm. Use that as an opportunity to try and get some weight off of them. Something that I've seen a lot, and I grew up in Wisconsin and Minnesota, is that in the winter, the horses stop getting ridden because understandably it's very, very cold and they just kind of go outside and get stuck in front of the the round bale for like four months, right? And they go into spring with the owner having the expectation, okay, we're going to go back to work and the horse is pretty rotund by then. If you can avoid that, I would highly recommend it. Um, I realize from a management perspective that does lend itself to being quite a bit easier than portioning out how much hay they're getting, but the consequences of obesity are so detrimental for the horse. I really encourage people to take a look at their horse body condition score. If my horse is a seven or greater, I'm not going to give him extra forage when it gets cold out. I'm going to wait until he's healthy body condition and then give him that. Sounds kind of mean, um, but I'd rather have my horse be healthy, you know, and maybe, maybe shiver a little bit. Shivering is just a way to generate energy. I don't like to see any horse shiver, but I want that horse to burn some of that stored energy it has so it can be healthy in those cold months. But um, in a number of circumstances, if you've got hard keepers, you know, give them as much as they'll eat in the winter. Just keep an eye on body condition and make sure that you don't end up in a zone where they're obese. If you have a horse that goes out to pasture in the winter, another thing to consider if during the show season, you know, maybe it takes five or six pounds of feed per day, which is, you know, a pretty fair amount to support them maintaining their workload and ideal body condition. And in the winter, they just get kind of stuck outside. What I want you to really think about too, kind of like a human athlete, you know, if we're doing a ton of exercise, let's say we're, we're planning for a marathon, we run it. And then, you know, after that, we kind of take a break and don't exercise our calorie needs are going to go way down when we stop that exercise. It's no different for our horses. So in that sense, if horses aren't doing as much work in the winter, you may need to think about, you know, going to potentially a ration balancer if they're just hanging out in front of a round bale of hay, or if they're, you know, it's such an individual basis. Some of them need the full amount of feed to maintain healthy body condition score. But again, it just kind of circles back to keeping an eye on your horse's body condition and adjusting the feed as needed. Your easy keepers, go with a ration balancer. Your harder keepers, there's a lot of different options for those guys. You can even think about a fat supplement. But um, think about adjusting as your workload adjusts. And the temperature, of course. Awesome. Awesome. Another person wanted to know uh, if you have a horse that has free choice salt available, but doesn't eat it, do you suggest supplementing that? I love that question. And I love talking about salt. That's actually how a lot of people um, know who I am. I was invited to do a podcast about salt with um, Dr. Jimmy Nichols. What I would suggest, um, a lot of horses just don't tend to like the texture of salt licks. They just don't like them. Horses do have, it really is the only mineral, that being sodium, that horses have an instinctual drive to consume it. However, what I would say is some of their distaste for actually, you know, those rough um, salt licks will deter them from consuming it. What I would do is I would try um, some other forms. So you can try uh, loose salt. Horses actually prefer that over block salt. You can try a Himalayan salt lick. Um, if, you know, there is some salt in, in the feed, not much though, because if you get too much, it becomes, uh, like a intake deterrent. So it's something that feed companies are not typically going to have enough sodium or salt in the ration to fulfill the horse's requirement. But I would say if you can try playing around with a couple of forms to get your horse to consume it, 
Um, some horses won't eat, you know, won't go to the salt lick their entire life and live to be 35 and be just fine. But truly such a great thing to have salt that they will readily consume when the temperature swings widely and you're concerned about uh, colic. If you have a horse, you know, that isn't a good water drinker, I suggest adding, um, or if you have a horse that's doing a lot of sweating, I suggest adding the salt or an electrolyte right into the ration. The maintenance amount of salt, if you're looking to add it to the ration, would be two tablespoons per day. And that would go up um, if you are going to be, you know, working really heavy, your horse is sweating all the time. So there's a few options there, but I would say with all the, the different products that we have out there, make sure that salt or sodium is the number one ingredient. If you are going to buy different blocks or electrolytes, because that is truly what you're after. And if, um, you know, some type of sugar or molasses is in the top couple ingredients, that's a big no. Because sometimes I'll have people that'll be like, oh, we got this salt block for my horse. And he went out and he ate the whole thing in three days. He must have been really deficient. It's like, no, it actually just tasted really good. Because I promise you, salt is not that exciting. But horses do have a drive to consume it. So great question. We had another uh one of our members that wanted to know if you could speak a little bit about brand mashes. They had mentioned that they opted out of doing a weekly brand mash at their barn, and they were curious about your thoughts uh, around the usefulness of brand mash. So brand mash is a um, good question, by the way, especially kind of, you know, coming out of winter. Brand mashes are very traditional kind of warm and fuzzy meal. You know, it's cold out. I'm going to make a warm bran mash, you know, fiber, help warm up my horse, give them some extra calories, put something in the gut. Um, you know, the thing that I would always recommend is consistency in the diet of the horse. Um, you know, bran on its own, it has uh, an inverse calcium to phosphorus ratio. Typically people aren't, which the calcium to phosphorus ratio um, you know, is really pretty important in the equine diet, not pretty important. It's very important in the equine diet. And if we get that out of sync too much, that can be problematic, especially in growing horses, but really any horse. So brand is, um, inverse in that ratio. However, usually with brand mashes, we're not giving enough that it throws off the entire diet, but it can, if you do too much. The other big thing is, you know, horses, as any of you listening would know, are very gut sensitive creatures. And we are always, you know, should always strive to be very slow and steady when it comes to dietary changes. And the reason, one big reason we do that is because the microbes that live in the gut of the horse, the enzymes that digest different nutrients need time to recognize new things because when they get flung something that they're not used to, especially in a large quantity, it can really cause shifts in those microbes that are detrimental to health, can cause digestive upset, diarrhea. That's not all the time. Some of our horses have like ironclad stomachs. You'd never, I mean, you could feed them something different every day. They'd be fine. But from a sake of consistency, I would say trying to go with something that they're used to um, instead of doing the random bran mash ever so often, you would just be increasing your risk of digestive upset um, by introducing something new randomly into the diet. Um, you know, like I said, it's kind of more that feel good meal for the humans. We feel warm and fuzzy thinking about giving our horse this hot meal, but um, you know, I would say just proceed with caution and give them something they're already used to. That's what I would recommend. Wonderful. Another person was asking if you could speak to um, guidelines for horses with chronic ulcers. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> in my um, nutrition, uh, on my website, LegacyEquine.com, I have a nutrition education seminar vault. So I'm really good friends with the leading equine ulcer expert in the world. His name is Dr. Ben Sykes, and he is based out of Australia. 
And him and I gave a few talks together in New Zealand um, in the past year. And the ulcer thing is incredibly complex. And what we know now, you know, horses that get pyloric, glandular, and then squamous, there's three different distinct regions. And the cause of, for instance, glandular ulcers is pretty much is still quite unknown. And that glandular lesions, which are in the lower portion of the stomach, the glandular portion is where the acid secreted and it's really much more protected than the upper portion. Most of our horses that get ulcers, they're going to be squamous ulcers. And that's that proximal or upper portion of the stomach where the acid splashes, like if we're trotting or cantering and there's nothing in the stomach, that acid can splash on that squamous or non-protected portion causing these um, ulcerative lesions. So when it comes to a diet that's ideal for these horses, it, it depends because the glandular ulcers don't respond to dietary changes. Um, the squamous ulcers respond really well to environment and dietary changes. What I would say is in very, very general terms, the best thing to do is continuous access to forage. We're trying to keep the pH of the stomach as neutral as possible. Keep that fiber mat in the stomach to help soak up the acid. Doing uh, low sugar starch, high fat diets can be really beneficial to these horses. There's some uh, research that came out about giving these guys, you know, corn oil every day, which I know is not going to be popular for most people listening. People tend to think of corn oil very negatively, but there was a research study that saw improvement in ulcer scores in horses that were fed, um, trying to think of the amount, it may have been around a half a cup of corn oil per day. That was kind of an interesting finding. But I would say, you know, a high fat, low sugar starch diet, continuous access to forage, small meals, small meals, small and frequent. Um, those are going to be some great options. What I would also say, stress plays a big role in uh, ulcer formation. So trying, I mean, what there's a lot that we do with horses that is incredibly stressful, whether we realize it or not, even if we move our horse from one side of the barn to the other or move him to a different paddock, that stresses horses out a lot and can actually result in um, ulcers, gastric upset. Now, not in all of them, but horses are so, so sensitive. But when it comes to squamous ulcers, you know, like I mentioned, we're trying to keep the pH of the stomach as buffered as possible. So in order to do so, continuous access to forage, continuous chewing, saliva actually does have a natural buffer in it. Um, so that's something that can help neutralize the pH of the stomach. There are some different gastric supplements out there that you can try that will that kind of act like a Tums and will buffer the stomach as well. So that's what I would say. When it comes to the glandular ulcers, there was um, a bit of work looking at C. buckthorn, and that came out of Dr. Andrew's lab at uh, Louisiana State. He does a lot of work in the U.S. with um, ulcer research. There aren't many products out there that you can find that have sea buckthorn in them. Uh, so that's a bit more difficult. And I'd say that the research, you know, there were some findings there, but I'm not sure how strong that is in uh, helping to cure them. But oftentimes, of course, it takes working with your vet and coming up with the right pharmaceutical protocol between mesoprostol, sucralfate, omeprazole, whatever kind of combination it may be to keep them at bay. But um, in general, you know, squamous ulcers, the diet, as I mentioned, as much forage, you know, keeping something in the stomach at all times, if you can. Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> Looks like we have two last questions. Uh, we had somebody that had stated, I have been told that beet pulp should be, should not be more than a third the amount of concentrated feed. For instance, one pound of beet pulp to three pounds of concentrated. Do you agree with that? And if not, what do you suggest? So one pound of beet pulp to three pounds concentrated? Mm. So beet pulp actually can can be incorporated pretty widely into the diet. You can replace 
your forage up to about 55% with beet pulp if you needed to. So I'm not really sure where the that kind of ratio came from or where the thought was about, um, you know, only having a certain number of parts beet pulp to concentrate or otherwise, but I would say you wouldn't want it to exceed over 55% of the forage component of the diet. But beyond that, I wouldn't see there being a problem. Um, interesting. I haven't heard that before, but uh, like I said, it is one of those things. If you get into a serious pinch, which there have been a couple pretty serious drought area or drought years in areas that I've lived in that people have actually had to do some forage replacement with beet pulp just out of desperation. And it is something that you can do that with. Um, beet pulp, it's a super fiber, as I mentioned, it's a highly fermentable fiber. So it provides really good food for the microbes in the gut, allowing them to proliferate. Um, so yeah, I guess that wouldn't be a concern of mine. The person had weighed in and said that came from an endurance rider, the, the third percentage or ratio third beet pulp thing yeah that oh man endurance riding that throws out the whole textbook i was at an endurance competition and spoke at an endurance convention a couple weeks ago everything i've said about consistency they just throw it away they (laughs) it's it's totally different way of uh feeding the horse but that's very interesting and thank you for that question i'll have to i'll have to ask my endurance folks more about that awesome Mm-hmm. Well, the final question I have thus far is somebody was looking to see if you have suggestions for a horse that can no longer eat forage. Um, they said that it's currently being fed grain and soaked hay cubes uh, and doing well and healthy in light work. You know, if really the best thing you can do it would be the soaked forage pellet or cube. If there's no if there's no choke risk, I would try, um, you know, without having more details, a lot of horses will quid, um, especially if it's an older horse. But if, if there's no choke risk, I would, even if it can't properly eat forage, I would still have long stem hay in front of it, even if it's in a slow feeder hay net. The reason being to continue promoting salivation and chewing, um, you know, but the that is really how you would want to do it. Just replacement with a forage pellet. Um, forage cubes are sometimes a heightened choke risk for those that are susceptible. So you'd want to make sure that you would soak them if you had compromised dentition in a horse. It sounds as though choke is a factor in that, in that particular situation. Got it. You know, then you do what you can and the best you can do is try and spread out the meals Do three to four per day. The biggest challenge with that, you know, it's they, the horse will end up going longer periods of time without something in the stomach, but at the same time, that's going to be, you know, if they're not affected by gastric upset and there's a number of horses that, um, you know, get fed seven in the morning and then 5 PM at night, they get fed hay twice a day and go long periods without it and aren't affected by gastric ulcers. I would never recommend that protocol, but, you know, the horse may be just fine. If we're trying to be more ideal, you know, we'd, we'd offer more forage or have them chewing and eating long stem forage. But if it's a risk for choke, just try and divide it into as many small meals as you can that are possible given the, the work, uh, or given the, the management program of the facility that your horse is at. So totally understood. Yeah. It's, a Choke, you know, and horses that are a choke risk for compromised dentition, or if you've had a horse that's had a severe choke in the past and maybe has some scar tissue in the esophagus, that can increase the risk pretty substantially too. So if that's what you got to do, then that's how you manage the horse. And if any kind of gastric um, ulcers flare up, then, you know, unfortunately you go the route of omeprazole treatment and uh, deal with that as it comes. But it sounds like that would be the best route given the situation. Awesome. Well, thank you for answering all those questions for us and for your very thorough presentation. I know I learned a lot. I hope everyone else did as well. Um, And I just want to take a moment to thank Dr. Rachel Motte for all of your awesome information. 
Uh, we'll make sure that we have her contact info available if anyone has further questions afterwards. And um, we got all kinds of thank yous rolling in. Everyone oh. felt that that was a fabulous presentation. So thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. And um, thank you, Hi Gain, for inviting me to do this. So. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I hope everyone has a good night. Have a great night. Bye-bye.